The baseball season seemed primed to return. Did it get a little wrench in the wheel? Plus, we'll talk a lot of Phillies. Scott Lauber covers the Phillies, Major League Baseball for the Inquirer, Inquirer Inquirer.com. And he joins us now on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline as we take a little closer look. You know, Scott, about a week ago, it felt like it was inevitable. Like, baseball's going to do this. They're not going to let anything get in their way. And I'm not suggesting that they are. But Blake Snell won a Cy Young Award. He's not some schlep rock guy. He's a pretty high-profile pitcher. When he comes out and says, I ain't playing for less money, uh, is that a little wrench in the wheel if there's other players of his ilk and magnitude that follow suit? It could be. Uh, it could be. I think there are two potential wrenches, uh, to use your uh, you, you, to use your wording there. I think one is is the... Uh, is the player compensation piece of all of this. And the other is the health and safety part of this. And to take the first part first, uh, and, and really, listen, I hope that um, I hope that the second part is really the one that they're focused mostly on. Because if you can't get the health and safety component ironed out, the, pay, the payment component doesn't even matter. Um, so I hope it's health over wealth, ultimately. And I think so far in their, in their talks, they have focused mostly on the health and safety aspect of it. The, the financial aspect will come up. It will be a thorny issue. And the, the crux of it is this. The players believe that the agreement that they reached with the owners on March 26th to, uh, to receive prorated portion of their salary based on number of games played, or if there is no season, to be paid out of a pool of money that was set aside for that purpose. They believe that that is, that that is the agreement that they made. Uh, the owners believe that there is language within that agreement that a- allows them to redraw that agreement if uh, the conditions change. And the conditions have changed in the sense that it does not look like there will be uh, fans in ballparks if they can come back, if the league can come back. Uh, and so as a result of that, their rev- the team's revenues will be less, as a result of which the owners say that they need to pay the players less. And they've proposed this 50-50 revenue split, which the players do not want any part of. They have spent 40 years fighting that sort of thing because they look at it like a salary cap. So this is where, where we're at. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I had a player say to me earlier today, um, they fully realize what this looks like. You know, it looks like millionaires fighting against billionaires, and nobody wants that. Or at least nobody wants to be uh, – to have that um, – to have that put upon them or to be reading about that or hearing about that. This is going to be a negotiation back and forth. I hope the owners and the players uh, can sort of do it discreetly and figure out a way to get past that uh, because if they can get the health and safety component ironed out and the season doesn't happen because of money, uh, that's going to be unforgivable in the eyes of a lot of fans. Yeah, and I know the Phillies are one team that has said, look, the the, the workers are fine. Everybody's going to be uh, up to date and uh, through the season, I guess, uh, through October. Uh, but I, I guess one of the things is, Scott, how many, you know, do you see also a battle between teams that want to play and owners that say, I'm going to lose more money if we play than I do if we don't play? Oh, I'm sure there's some of that. Um, but I don't know. Uh, the feeling I get is that um, both sides want to play because there's more money to be made if they play than if they don't play. I mean, if they play, at least they'll have television revenue and television money. And if they can get to a postseason, that's where the real money is at, the big money in, in October. Um, and for the players, same thing. I mean, they'll get paid more if they play than if they don't. So from a financial standpoint, you know, yeah, no one's going to make as much money as they made last year where uh, the industry as a whole had record revenues. I think it was $10.7 billion, according to the Forbes estimate. Um, no one's going to make as much as they made last year, but they'll make more if they play than if they don't play. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, from what I've heard at least, for as much as players are um, digging in on the money aspect of this and not wanting to uh, – to do a revenue sharing agreement and, and, and wanting to hold to that, to that March agreement rather than drop a new one and take further pay cuts. As much as that's an issue, I, I hear more from players about, you know, Hey, what's going to be done here to make sure that we're safe because they're the ones incurring the risk. They're the ones that are going back to work into an environment where uh, their health and their safety might be compromised and the health and safety of their families. Um, 
when they come home at night after games and whatnot. So, you know, that's the, that's the thing where I think they want a lot of answers. They want to know exactly what's being, what's going to be done to minimize the risk. You can't take the risk out completely, but to minimize it to a point where they can play and not have to fear that they're going to contract the virus. It says here, John Heyman tweeted this out, that the MLB's position is that it will lose more money if they play the games without fans and they pay prorated salaries than if they don't play at all. Now, is there actual proof? Could that possibly be the owners and the MLB trying to get the players sucked in? I I couldn't tell you because we don't have access to to the books. You know, we don't have access to the finances. Um of, of each and every team, I suppose it's possible. Um, you know, MLB has said that on average, teams derive about forty percent of their revenue from gate-related revenue streams, uh, ticket sales, luxury suites, parking concessions being the big ones. Uh, anything that that uh, any stream that uh, is related to to the gate or fans being in the ballpark. So uh, that still leaves sixty percent of the pie, and most of that comes from television money. So there's a lot of money there. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure that there's going to be posturing back and forth either way. I just, you know, the reality of the situation is if you want baseball back in 2020, it's going to be without fans in the seats. So they either figure out a way to make that work or we don't have baseball in 2020. And we, we hope that we can do it in 2021 with fans. And there's no guarantee of that either, at least at the outset. So, um, you know, these are things they're going to have to work through and it's all part of, it's all part of the negotiation process. Scott Lover, uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer, Inquirer.com is with us. So if we do have baseball, we're going to have a different look. Uh, most likely, we're going to have uh, a shortened season. Uh, is the feel that the games would be at Citizens Bank Park with no fans and, uh, you know, Yankee Stadium and, and uh, whatever they're calling the Mets place at uh, City Field, uh, are they going to play in their home ballparks? Is that the understanding you have at this point, Scott? Uh, my understanding is that's the preference um, is to have is to have everyone do that. Now, some of this is not in baseball's hands. Um, you know, municipalities and states are going to have to reopen and allow for that to happen. Uh, there are going to be some problem areas. Canada, for instance, the Blue Jays play in Toronto, and you know, um, last I heard, um, you know, with with regard to the NHL, at least. Um, Canada was talking about quarantines when you enter the country and things like that. It could force the Blue Jays perhaps to play at their spring training ballpark in Dunedin, Florida, uh, something like that, make a contingency plan. Um, you know, every city and every state right now is in a little bit of a different spot. Um, just because the virus seems to have peaked in certain places like New York uh, does not mean it's reached its peak in others. Um, so uh, Detroit was a problem at one point. I think Chicago was having issues. Uh, Los Angeles has put some uh, big restrictions in place. Uh, Boston has put some big restrictions in place. So, you know, this is going to be another piece of this where they need to go and get federal, state, and local approval uh, in order to play. And that'll be that'll be a component that, that they're going to be working on here as well. What do you think the advantage is of playing in the ballparks without fans compared to being in a city that's be, that's just them quarantined like the NBA is discussing, whether that's in Florida or Las Vegas. I can't seem to find what the advantage would be of being in their normal stadiums. Well, I think there's two. Um, there's two that I can see right off the bat. I think one is from the player standpoint, um, you know, the first couple of plans that were floated as ideas were the Arizona quarantine plan and the Arizona Florida plan. And at least in the Arizona one, uh, the players were going to have to essentially live in isolation. So leave your families, um, move to Arizona for four and a half months or however long the season's going to be. Um, and that was a non-starter for a lot of players who don't want to leave their families behind in the middle of a pandemic. There are players whose wives are expecting in the summer, and they had questions related to, you know, would they be allowed to attend the birth of their children? If they were, would they have to be quarantined for two weeks upon their return? How would that affect their teams? Um, so uh, there's that aspect of it. And then there's, you know, look, if baseball comes back this year, it's going to be a made-for-television event. And if you have every team go out to, say, Arizona, then you've got to figure out how to schedule the games so that the Phillies are playing uh, essentially primetime games 
on the East Coast. Um, uh, it's not going to be easy uh, to schedule games so that they're time zone friendly if all the games take place in one place. And if we're doing this for television, um, you know, if that's going to be the idea, fans can't go, so they've got to derive their their enjoyment of the game from watching it on TV. You can't really have games begin at uh, difficult times back in their own home time zone. So uh, that's a logistical thing that was going to be an issue with some of the first few plans. And if you have the games in your home ballpark, and if you have them, uh, essentially, uh, if you essentially realign it so that it's a regionalized league, so that the Phillies would play teams in the NL East and AL East, then all the games are played in the same time zone and they're uh, easily televised and, uh, you know, presumably the ratings would be through the roof because that would be the only way that people could watch the games would be to watch them on TV. So that's the idea. And obviously doing it in your home ballparks and a regional type schedule makes that a whole lot easier. Scott Lauber uh, with us here from the Inquirer. While we're talking a little baseball, uh, one thing, one plan is for the National League to adopt the DH, and that's going to get in. And I would imagine once it gets in, it's probably not going to leave, uh, which would bring up the question of, Alec Bohm, I and mean, I wonder, and I saw you write something about this. I also offered uh, that as well as some options to be the DH. And at first, you look at the Phillies, and you're thinking, okay, they might have some options. And I'm looking around, and I'm like, all right, Jay Bruce, uh, Jay Bruce, and then it hit me. <laughs> what about Alec Bohm? I mean, is he a guy that uh, they could say because of the DH, that's his fast track to getting up here immediately? They could. Uh, it's definitely a possibility. You know. There, there's an interesting thing about the DH, uh, and and we can really get into this, but I'll just sort of gloss over it, is that over the course of, of time, and it feels like really within the last five or six years or so, uh, even a lot of American League teams which have a DH every day, they've, they've looked at the position a little bit differently than they did traditionally, where you know, traditionally you build a team and you know you want someone in every position who can play every day and so you sign a conventional DH, whether it's, you know, or you, or you have a conventional DH, whether it's David Ortiz or Edgar Martinez or, uh, you know, any of the guys that we think of as great DHs of, of years past. And what a lot of American League teams have begun to do with regard to the DH is use it as a position to cycle players through so that you can give a guy a little bit of a rest. You can, let's say you've got JT Real Muto and he's your catcher. Well, on days he, he doesn't catch, he can stay in the lineup as the DH. So rather than um, finding a player and identifying a guy and saying, that's my DH, he's going to play 162 games as the DH, they use the position as kind of a revolving door. And I think you'll see a lot of National League teams w who did not plan on having a DH this season approach it that way. So the Phillies, for example, you know, Jay Bruce could get still get the majority of the, of the starts at DH uh, but you could see a scenario where Andrew McCutcheon coming off of surgery on his knee, uh, just, you know, could, could use a blow. So he doesn't have to play the field that day. He can DH. Or as I said, Real Muto can stay in the lineup when he's not catching and he can DH. Or you can, you know, have Alec Bohm DH against, against lefties and you can have Jay Bruce DH against righties. Maybe Reese Hoskins could, could, could cycle through that, um, uh, that position as well. So you could use it as kind of a vehicle for giving guys sort of a semi-rest. So instead of having to play defense, they can get four at-bats a game, stay in the lineup, have a chance to impact the game, and, and get a bit of a rest. And I think that's what you'll see a lot of National League teams do, and, and it might be what the Phillies would wind up doing with, with, with the DH themselves. Yeah, and another guy that I threw in there uh, as an option would be Roman Quinn. I guess there's a way to kind of keep him healthy, not having to play the outfield. There's a way that you can try to sneak him in the lineup without uh, making him do double duty on a day. You could certainly do that. You could also use Quinn and Hazley as a way to, to, to give McCutcheon uh, a break. Um, you know, and, and you could have McCutcheon DH and put Quinn and Hazley in left and center. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's – you know, load management is is kind of a funny word, right? We especially in this city, we talk about load management with regard to the Sixers and how they handle Joel Embiid. Well, there, there, are, you know, there's a certain amount of load management that you can do in baseball when you have the DH. Um, I don't know how much you'll need it in a shortened season where they're playing half the number of games that they normally do. Um, if you're healthy and you're and you're um, and you're ready to go, you should be able to essentially handle that workload. But uh, the point being that you know um, when the national League, when the the DH comes uh, to the National League and is here to stay, you don't necessarily have to go out and sign JD Martinez to be your everyday DH. 
you could use that position in a lot of different ways. Uh, Scott Lauber is uh, with us here at Scott Lauber on Twitter. Make sure you check out his new book, The Big 50, uh, The Men and the Moments uh, of the Philadelphia Phillies. It is out now wherever you buy books, and uh, it's an excellent book. I just finished it up, and Scott, uh, we appreciate your time as always, pal. Anytime, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, yep. Scott Lauber, like all guests, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline.